you plan to spend your summer vacation in Africa. The final destination is the Sahara Desert. It's located in northern Africa, stretching from the Atlantic Ocean to the Red Sea. You're excited to ride camels and learn about the region's rich cultures. You hop on an extensively long flight, and finally, you are here. You find yourself in the world's biggest hot desert. Can you believe it's 3 million square miles? You're ready for your first adventure after drinking liters of ice-cold water. The guide gives you a choice. You can spend two weeks visiting a collection of oases, or you can help them solve an ongoing local mystery. Deep into the desert, near this Algerian town, lies a mystery begging to be solved. A collection of huge, spotted circles in the sand. There are dozens of them, stretching for miles in a straight line. The circles were first identified via Google Earth images several years ago. People have debated them for years, but no one seems to know the answer. The strange thing is that they are so many miles away from any towns, roads, or human activity. The quickest way to discover the truth behind the circles is asking questions. You grab your notebook and sit up to talk to locals. Everyone is helpful in this scenario – geographers, anthropologists, elders, and historians. The first person you talk to is a map expert. You need to understand if those circles were authentic or a satellite glitch. You end up interviewing the people who take Google Earth satellite pictures. The circles are really there. They appear in multiple pictures from many years. Then, let's understand why they are there in the first place. After two days of interviews, you have your first lead. The circles could be the result of oil activity. Experts explain why this would make sense. Algeria is a rich area for natural resources, so this would be a sensible guess. Usually, to find out if there is anything worth extracting, companies would undertake seismic surveys. Seismic surveys are a way of analyzing the Earth's surface by sending shock waves into the ground. Depending on how these waves bounce back, you'll know what is located there. A special vehicle could have marked the soil that way. So, did we unravel the mystery? Mm, not quite so. As you know, the Sahara Desert is one of the driest areas on the planet. The average high temperatures in summer are over 104 degrees Fahrenheit. To survive there, people need to find ways of accessing water. So, these circles could be a kind of ruin or leftovers from ancient water wells. Again, I'd say this is a sensible guess. Ready for some fact-checking? Some anthropologists agree that these circles could be ancient fogueras. Fagera is the name of a 2,500-year-old style of irrigation system, usually found in northern Africa. It is also known as a kanat in other places in northern Africa. Locals would dig a deep well at an elevated point, deep enough to tap into underground water. They would then dig parallel shafts at regular distances. Then, they would dig an underground channel that connected the city to the well. Solely with the help of gravity, water would run from the well to the city. This traditional technology provided water for crops, livestock, and humans. Now, let's say these wells made human-made oases possible. Even the closest municipality name was an indication that this could be true. The name Fagaret Esaoya is actually named after Fagarets, these ancient wells. Now, this lead was proving to be very accurate you decide to travel over there to see for yourself. You take a local bus, sit back, and enjoy the ride. The landscape in northern Algeria is filled with ancient-looking towns. You even see ruins of wells along the way, on the outskirts of smaller cities. Opening Google satellite images, you can see the Kanat's markings on the ground, a series of holes running down several miles. But as soon as you arrive, you find out you were wrong. Dale Lightfoot, one of the world's leading experts on Kanats, said that the circles were definitely not Kanats. Even the satellite images confirm this difference. Uh-oh, we were so close! Apparently, Kanats or Fagras would not run down a straight line. They wouldn't be shaped like circles. Another clue that this wasn't the case was that there were no towns at the end. The circles were really far away from any human activity and Kanats were explicitly built to provide water for human settlements. Well, it sure was a good try. You almost gave up on this mystery when you decided to take one more field trip. It was days of preparation, 
pick up cars, food, equipment, also that the mystery of the Sahara Circles could be unraveled. On the first day, you drove over 99 miles into the desert. You were always curious to see what this part of the world looked like. Over there, you see nothing but mustard yellow dunes. The night sky is pretty decent, though. You can see the entire Milky Way with your own eyes. You set up camp and sleep under a canopy of stars. The next day, tension grows. There's no cell reception. Oh dear. But thankfully, you added the coordinates of the circles to your Google map. And surprise, the offline mode works out there. You follow the coordinates, but it leads you astray. You start to get nervous, thinking this was all in vain. But you and the team get into the car and drive a few more miles past the coordinates on your phone. After a very bumpy ride, you can't believe your eyes. There it is, an enormous crater dug on the sand, surrounded by 12 smaller holes. From up high, it looks like a clock. Without the pointers, of course. On the ground, they're very faint. So faint, you almost miss them. Searching the area, you notice all the holes had something similar. Metal wires. Thin wires that you can pull from the ground. They're buried deep, so you start digging. An object starts to reveal itself. Uh-oh! It looks like old dynamite. This certainly surprises you. Um, better stop digging to avoid any accidents. At the end of the survey, you feel satisfied, but still curious. What could all this dynamite mean? And who put it there? What comes next is the turning point of your adventure. Walking back to the car, you see something shining on the ground. You approach the item with curiosity. It's round and rusty and looks like a sardine can. What's that doing here? Could this give you more clues about the circle's mystery? Just in case, you pick it up and put it in the car. Back in the city, the puzzle pieces start to reveal the story behind the Sahara Circles. You bring photos in the sardine can and show them to local experts. They analyze your material and give you an intriguing verdict. As it turns out, guess number one was the closest one to the truth. So what happened to the first guess? Why do we need to keep digging deeper? Well, because it was only half right. The Sahara Circles are not a historical footprint of seismic surveying. Back when the circles were made, this technology didn't even exist. But they sure are related to oil exploration. The dynamite-filled holes were an old method for oil searching. The circles are the leftovers of surveyors looking for resources underground. And the sardine cans? Well, they were left by the workers who held explosion works. You gotta eat, right? According to the model of the can, this happened more or less around the 1950s and 1960s. So these circles aren't even that ancient. More like modern ones, if you ask me. Well, well, well. Hope you are glad you tagged along and helped unravel this mystery. See you in the next mystery-solving adventure. Discovering hidden places on our planet is extremely exciting. Today, I'm taking you on a trip that you aren't going to forget anytime soon. But suit up. This is about to get very cold. You hop on a plane and land on the ice-covered island of Greenland. An unbelievable view of the Aurora Borealis, aka the Northern Lights, is greeting you. You can't believe your eyes. Your guide tells you how rare this phenomenon is. Usually, people spend days trying to hunt it down. You feel lucky and take your time to appreciate these beautiful dancing greenish lights. You're glad you brought your camera along, aren't you? Between clicks, you learn that the Aurora Borealis is the result of some rather rough events. This spectacular light show occurs when energy particles from the sun slam into Earth's upper atmosphere. On day two, you continue to explore the place by air. This may not come as a surprise, but Greenland is one of the world's largest islands. This time, on board a helicopter, you can see the infinite icy landscape. In case you're curious, you're now flying over 656,000 square miles of thick ice. Oh, what's that down there? It looks like a family of polar bears. You don't want to get too close, of course. The conditions in Greenland might be too tough for people to live there, but some animal species do very well in this land of ice. Those are reindeer, wolves, and arctic foxes. On your way to Greenland, you probably made a pit stop in Copenhagen. Denmark is one of the few countries that have commercial flights to Greenland. You didn't know this before, 
but you find out that the island is actually part of the Kingdom of Denmark. On a map, it's right between the Arctic and Atlantic Oceans. You're lucky to have a local pilot that tells you about the secrets hidden in this scenery. Under this two mile thick white surface, there's an entirely different world. A world filled with canyons, meteor carved craters, and millennia old plant fossils. You are beyond excited to go visit one of these spots, but of course, you'll have to use your imagination, as all of it is hidden under ice. Believe it or not, nearly 80% of the island's surface is covered with it. The first stop on your tour is Greenland's Grand Canyon. You land not far from it, somewhere in the northern part of the island. You may know that canyons are deep, narrow valleys with steep sides, but I bet you didn't know that the word canyon actually comes from the Spanish word canyon, which means tube or pipe. Now, this Grand Canyon has some similarities with the one in the US. First of all, in size, it's at least 460 miles long and up to 2,600 feet deep in some places. There's a true subglacial valley down there, and if you're wondering how this happened, well, the canyon had probably been formed by a river that had been flowing through Greenland before the ice took over. Oh yeah, Greenland hasn't always been covered with ice. It was once green, no pun intended. Many other icy places on Earth, such as Antarctica, were once covered in greenery. Scientists have figured out that in the past, Greenland was mostly ice-free. With the help of airborne radar, they made amazing discoveries. By the way, ice is invisible to radar technology. If you have trouble believing it, try putting an ice cube inside your microwave. It won't melt or heat up. A recent discovery of fossilized plants allowed researchers to estimate that Greenland used to be much warmer than they could imagine. 2021 research conducted by the University of Vermont found fossils of twigs and leaves, which left researchers very confused. They expected to discover sand and rocks in the deepest layer of ice, but instead, they found some clear proof of rich flora. Judging by what you've seen of the landscape, it's hard to believe that forests were once growing here. Today, you'll find some tundra vegetation on the coastal part of the island, and that's pretty much it. But according to the genetic material found in these fossilized plants, researchers believe the island used to be much greener. It's very likely that there were insect-filled forests with butterflies and beetles flying around. And the average temperature on the island varied from 50 degrees Fahrenheit in the summer to 1 degrees Fahrenheit in the winter. NASA's Operation Ice Bridge has flown over Greenland more than 100 times. This has allowed researchers to create 3D maps of the island and figure out the age of each layer of ice in Greenland's ice sheet. Ice sheets can help answer many scientific questions as they form over the span of thousands of years. They're layers of snow on top of more snow. The snow gets compacted into ice, which in turn creates what we call an ice sheet. Remember those fossils we were talking about? They're believed to be from the Eemian period, which was 130,000 to 115,000 years ago. According to the groundbreaking 3D footage from NASA, we can see three distinct climate periods within the ice sheet. The uppermost layer is quite flat and uniform. If you decided to dig deeper, you'd find the layer formed during the last ice age. It's more complex and rugged. The ice there is darker than what you see on the surface. If you let your mind wander, you can picture what this part of the world looked like when mammoths were roaming around. If you kept digging, you'd eventually find leftover ice from the Eemian period I've told you about. Now, canyons aren't the only unusual thing found under ice. If you could sneak a peek under all those layers of snow, you'd see an impressive mountain range and also plunging fjords. In 2017, scientists created a map that showed what Greenland had looked like without all that ice. There was a bowl-like depression in the middle of the enormous island. This depression was most likely an ancient lake. Around it, there was a circle of coastal mountain ranges. This scenery probably resembled the landscapes of modern Patagonia. Big mountains with snowy tops surrounding crystalline lakes. This ancient lake in Greenland is a wonder on its own. Imagine a pit the size of Rhode Island and Delaware put together. The lake is believed to have covered over 2,700 square miles, and back in the day, it was fed by at least 18 different streams. These crystalline blue waters were surely very inviting, 
and freezing, of course. But if you ended up going for a swim, I'd say be careful, as the water could get up to 800 feet deep in some places. On day three of your adventure, you discover a true under ice water park. While you're wandering around the ice covered island, your guide tells you to be mindful of the cracks in the surface. These cracks are responsible for the modern day aqua lounge going on down there. Meltwater and rainwater flow down the cracks in the ice all the way down to the riverbeds. This forms a landscape of jewel like lakes and streams filled with crystalline water. Researchers estimate that about 60 small under ice lakes exist there. And yes, they're actual lakes. Perhaps one of the most impressive hidden features on this island is a meteor crater. Under the Hiawatha Glacier, you can find a 19-mile-wide impact crater big enough to swallow the city of Washington. Apparently, a mile-wide iron asteroid struck Earth's atmosphere within the past 100,000 years and chose Greenland as its landing point. If anyone had been around to see it, they'd have witnessed a real show, a white glowing fireball cutting through the sky. Scientists speculate that if it had landed on an ice sheet, it certainly vaporized both water and stone. Someone standing hundreds of miles from the impact site would have heard a deafening thunderclap and experienced hurricane force winds. But it actually makes sense. The approximate speed of meteors entering Earth's atmosphere is 45,000 miles per hour. For comparison, that is two and a half times the speed of a spaceship. It's bound to make some noise and leave a huge crater in the ground. Imagine you can spend an entire week digging in the ground, scanning for ruins, and taking photographs of the world's most surreal archaeological sites. Would you be up for it? Grab your magnifying glasses, and let's do some digging. When in Rome, do as the Romans do. Walk around the city stumbling upon ancient history, I mean. So you're strolling around Esquiline Hill on a sunny afternoon. You have just finished your third gelato when you suddenly see it. The magnificent Dalmas Aurea, or Golden House, for the non-Latin speakers. The Roman Emperor Nero ordered to build this huge palace back in 64 BCE. The construction finished in 68 BCE. In its glory days, it occupied an area three times the size of the Vatican City. The building had gold leaf decor, semi-precious stones, and tons, tons of frescoes. There were over 300 rooms in the palace, some of them overlooking the beautiful vineyard and animal-filled woods nearby. It held an enormous 100-foot statue of Nero himself. The octagonal wall was the grandest construction in the complex. Originally, it was a banquet hall with waterfalls cascading down the back walls. The hall rotated around its axis day and night as petals fell from above. Nero's successors stripped the whole palace of its materials. Today, tourists can visit the main structure and, of course, the octagonal hall. They excavated it, and you'll easily recognize it even with its bare walls. After flying halfway across the world, we're deep in the Cambodian jungle. Good thing you brought bug spray with you. Mosquitoes can get crazy in this tropical climate. Hidden among the forest is the city of Angkor. It was the capital of the Khmer Empire from the 9th to 15th century. FYI, the word Angkor means capital city in the Khmer language. The city became one of the largest in the pre-industrial world. Researchers say nearly 1 million people used to live there. Today, Angkor attracts visitors from around the world because of its stunning architecture. You can recognize the Khmer style in the use of huge blocks of sandstone. At the center of the complex lies Bayon Temple. It's decorated with 216 smiling faces, which scientists say are meant to resemble the founder of the Angkor Empire. They believe the towers used to be decorated with gold, but today the site is a maze of vine-covered temples. The city was abandoned in 1431 and wasn't rediscovered until the 1840s. In 1992, they named it a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The United States is not usually synonymous with ruins, but here's one. In the mountainous state of Colorado lies the ancient home place of ancestral Pueblons. Throughout the Mesa Verde National Park, there are over 600 cliff dwellings built by the Pueblons around the 1190s. 
The Cliff Palace alone had over 150 rooms. It was a multi-story building of sandstone and mud mortar. To arrive at the balcony house, visitors had to climb a 32-foot ladder. There, you can see a mid-sized village of 38 rooms and two kivas. Kivas are traditional chambers built by Pueblons for ceremonial purposes. By 1300, the Pueblon occupation of the Mesa Verde ended. Thankfully, the site is open for visits now. If you like terracotta landscapes, you came to the right place. The city of Petra is a marvel of the ancient world. Located in Jordan's desert, the city was a commercial hub back in the 4th century BCE. The Nabataeans, an Arab Bedouin tribe, lived in the so-called Rose City and thrived for many years, accumulating a significant amount of wealth. They invented an innovative water management system that made the region habitable. The rock-carved gate-light structure Petra is famous for is what is called the Pharaoh's Treasury. It stands at the main entrance to the site and is said to have a hidden treasure beneath it. In the early 2000s, the site was named one of the seven new wonders of the world. All the way in South America, in the country of Guatemala, lie ancient Mayan ruins. The lost city of Tikal is a site made of 12,000 buildings, the remains of the capital of the ancient Mayan Empire. It is comparable in importance to London or New York. The North Acropolis is Tikal's most ancient complex of monuments. Built solely by human hands in 750 BCE, it served as the resting place of kings and chiefs. Back in the day, the Step Pyramid temples were painted a beautiful red. Mayans loved that color. Today, of course, you'll only see the limestone. Archaeologists have no clue as to the cause of Tikal's decline. Was it drought? disease, or something else altogether. Located on the left bank of the River Tigris is a strange old ruin, a battered archway. It belonged to a city named Tesiphon, the jewel of the Persian Empire for over 800 years. The city hosted an extravagant palace, decorated with a glass mosaic, jewel-adorned carpets, and a lot of marble. What is it with royalty and marble anyway? The arch was part of an imperial palace complex. Until modern times, it was the largest man-made freestanding vault. Notice how there are no pillars sustaining it. The enormous wealth of the city made it a constant target for other empires, until it eventually fell. In the mood for some more Mayan ruins? Chichen Itza is an archaeological site with the best preserved pyramids on Earth. Located in Mexico's Yucatan state, this Mayan city is well over 1,500 years old. At its peak, it was home to 35,000 people. The site has a total of 26 ruins to be uncovered. The highlight here is El Castillo, a tremendous step-like temple standing 80 feet above the ground. Its most peculiar feature is that it has 91 steps up each of its four sides, including the upper platform. It makes for 365 steps, the number of days in the solar year. The oldest lost city in this list dates back to the Neolithic period. It was when us, human beings, started farming for the first time, instead of living a fully nomadic lifestyle based on hunting and gathering. Located on Orkney Island, off the coast of Scotland, is a prehistoric site known as Scara Bray. Thanks to good restoration, the site is very well preserved. You can see prehistoric dwellings with hearths, stone-built furniture, and even primitive toilets. Researchers found runic symbols on the site, which means they could have attempted some form of writing. Ah, Greece. Fancy some feta cheese, anyone? We've arrived at the focal point of archaeological sites, but today we're exploring one in particular, the Colossus of Rhodes also known as the Bronze Giant. It used to be one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, standing in the harbor of the Greek city of Rhodes back in the 3rd century BCE. The Colossus was said to be 105 feet tall. It's believed that the statue was built with the help of 900 camels. Sadly, it only stood for 54 years. A ravaging earthquake tore it to pieces, so visitors would come and see only a giant foot. Now, there is a whole load of nothing where the statue once stood. 
I think it's safe to say there are a lot of random ruins on walls spread across the globe. And our final visit for the day consists of exactly those. All the way in northern England lies the ruin of Hadrian's Wall. The Roman emperor commissioned the wall in order to separate his empire from Britain's. The original wall was a lot grander than what is left of it today. But still, the ruins are pretty impressive. They consist of a 73-mile structure stretching from one coast to the other. Back in the day, Hadrian's Wall hosted 17 large forts and numerous observation towers to ensure the maximum safety of his empire. The wall fell into oblivion when the Romans left Britain at the start of the 5th century. People began looting it to build churches, farms, and even houses. Today, if you decide to visit the ruins, you'll only see waist-high fragments of stone. But still, pretty neat, huh? The Statue of Liberty is 305 feet tall and stands on Liberty Island in New York. It's one of the most famous tourist attractions that the Big Apple has to offer. It was given to America as a gift from France in 1886. The statue was designed by a French sculptor called Frédéric Auguste Bartholdi. The face of the statue is thought to be based on Bartholdi's mother, Charlotte. The statue's full name is the Statue of Liberty Enlightening the World which is a bit of a tongue twister. We'll stick with the shortened version for the rest of this video. The total cost to build the statue was over $500,000. In today's economy, that would be worth about $10 million. It took five years to raise the necessary amount of money to build the statue. The project was completed in France in 1885. The statue was then disassembled into 350 pieces so that it could be transported to America. A French ship called Isère transported the statue from Paris to New York. However, a disaster nearly prevented the statue from arriving. The ship almost sank in a bad storm during the voyage. It took four months to reassemble the 350 pieces when they arrived in New York. The monument was officially unveiled in October 1886. The statue is made from 300 overlapping copper plates. These copper plates weigh a total of 31 tons. A further 125 tons of iron were used to build the statue's foundation. The statue itself weighs 225 tons. Its crown has 25 windows. They're thought to represent the natural minerals of the earth. The Statue of Liberty was the tallest iron structure ever built when it was unveiled in 1886. But today, It doesn't even crack the top five when it comes to the tallest existing statues. Let's take a look at several monuments from around the world, which, in some cases, tower over the famous New York Monument. But before we get down to the giants in the world of statues, you should know something. Not all of the most famous statues are physically imposing spectacles. Some of the most renowned monuments are actually quite tiny. This includes the Iron Boy, located in one of the backyards in Stockholm, Sweden. The sculpture depicts a small boy wrapping his arms around his knees. It was created by a Swedish artist called Lis Eriksson in 1967. The statue is only six inches tall. The tiny monument's full name translates to Little Boy Who Looks at the Moon, but people shortened it for their own convenience. The Iron Boy receives all kinds of strange gifts throughout the year. Sometimes, he can be seen wearing a cap or a scarf. Guests also leave coins, fruits, and sushi on the stone bench where he sits. There's another famous world monument that's literally as tiny as a mouse. Actually, two mice. The monument is called the Philpot Lane Mice and can be found in London. It depicts two mice fighting over a piece of cheese. The statue was constructed in 1862. The story claims that once, two construction workers had an argument. One was accused of having stolen the other's lunch. This tiny monument is said to be left as a tribute to the event. Starting off the top five of the tallest monuments in the world is the Statue of Belief. It's found in Nathwarda, India. It stands at an impressive 348 feet tall. The statue depicts Shiva, an important symbol of Hinduism. About 2,200 tons of steel were used in the construction of the massive statue. A 300-square-foot garden surrounds the statue. 
more than 750 workers took part in the construction of the monument. Its size allows it to be seen from Kankroli flyover, which is roughly 13 miles away. The construction works began in 2012, but the statue was completed just recently. It's probably no surprise that it serves as a major tourist attraction in Nathdwara today. The Yushiku Buddha statue is located in Tsukuba in Japan. It's the fourth tallest statue in the world, with a height of 393 feet. The monument weighs an incredible 4,000 tons and was built in 1993 to commemorate the birth of Shinran, a famous Japanese monk. The left hand of the monument is 60 feet long. Tourists can ride an elevator to the viewing gallery, located at almost 280 feet. From here, visitors are treated to incredible views. On a clear day, you can see as far as Tokyo Skytree, which is roughly 42 miles away from the monument. The lovely gardens surrounding the statue are full of flowers in season. Visitors can pick some and take them home. You can see cosmos in September and October, poppies in May, and peonies and hydrangeas in May and June. The third tallest monument on our planet is the Lekyun Setkyar. It's found in a village called Katakan Taung in Myanmar. The statue is 423 feet tall. The construction of the monument began in 1996, and it took 12 years to finish. The monument was presented to the public in February 2008. The construction took so much time because it was funded by the public. The monument is a depiction of Buddha Shakyamuni, who many believe to be the founder of Buddhism. The sculpture is painted yellow, which is considered to be the color of wisdom in Buddhism. Each element of the monument is extremely precise and detailed. Many tourists have no idea that inside the monument, there's a special elevator that provides access to 27 different floors. Visitors can enter the statue and look at different paintings on the walls of the lower floors. The inside of the monument also houses a temple. The area outside the statue is a popular landmark for tourists, too. Here you can find the surrounding garden of Bodhi trees, with more than 9,000 plants. Not only are there plenty of plants next to the monument, but there are also thousands of miniature sitting Buddha statues. Keeping with the theme of monuments depicting Buddhas, the runner-up in the competition for the world's largest monument is the Spring Temple Buddha. You'll find it in Henan, China. It's over 500 feet tall. The monument is made up of over 200 pounds of gold, 3,300 tons of copper alloy, and 1,500 tons of steel. It also covers an area of over 11,000 square feet. The diamond seat beneath the statue consists of 6,666 miniature Buddhas. It took 11 years to construct. Construction works began in 1997, and the statue was unveiled in 2008. The entire Spring Temple project cost roughly $50 million, with $18 million spent directly on the materials and construction of the monument. You've waited this long. It's now time to find out the identity of the world's tallest statue. The Statue of Unity is in the state of Gujarat in India. Its height? Just under a record-breaking 600 feet. Worth the wait, right? The statue is a tribute to the Iron Man of India, Sardar Vallabhai Patel. He served as the first Deputy Prime Minister of India from 1947 until 1950. He's credited with merging over 560 princely states into what we now know as the Union of India. Remarkably, when compared to the other statues we've looked at, the Iron Man only took three and a half years to build. It was constructed by a team of 300 engineers and 3,400 workers. The monument is made up of roughly 70,000 tons of cement and nearly 25,000 tons of steel. 12,000 bronze panels cover the structure. The base of the monument is constructed with over 129 tons of scrap iron, donated by nearly 100 million farmers from across India. All in all, the statue weighs a total of 1,700 tons. The Statue of Unity has a viewing gallery that can accommodate 200 visitors at a time. It also hosts a museum with 2,000 photographs, 40,000 documents and video presentations, and a research center. 
the whole thing, is nearly twice the size of the Statue of Liberty. Wow! Are you bored of where you live? Fed up with not having a room with a moat? Or a garden big enough for a parade of elephants? Maybe it's time for a change. So, here are a few options to think about in your house search. First up, have you ever considered renting Buckingham Palace? Smack dab in the center of London, the sprawling palace is one of the most visited tourist spots in the UK, especially for people looking for a taste of the royal treatment. In the early 1700s, the Duke of Buckingham commissioned an architect named William Wind to build Buckingham House. Yes, house, not palace. It was only the early beginnings of what the Grand Palace looks like today. In 1761, King George III bought Buckingham House for his wife, Queen Charlotte. But it was their son, King George IV, who began to morph Buckingham Palace into its current magnificence. Maybe, in fact, he may have gone a bit overboard. King George IV had great taste in decor. He appointed John Nash, a neoclassical architect, to elevate the building and its grounds to a shining monument of opulence. Parliament agreed to cover 150,000 pounds, about $200,000 of the bill. But by the end, the renovation costs had spiraled out of control to nearly half a million which is close to $1 billion in today's currency. With 775 rooms, the palace has a lot to offer, including some unique features that you might not find in other properties on the market, such as a river that runs beneath it. Back in the day, the River Tyburn was packed with salmon, a fisherman's daydream. Today, it flows through an underground channel, trickling beneath Buckingham Palace on its way through London. Some fishing enthusiast organizations have rallied to bring the river back up above ground, but that would mean tearing down several buildings along the way, including Buckingham Palace. So they might need to settle for other places to cast off for the time being. Buckingham Palace's 39-acre garden has many uses. It's the Queen's private London garden, and it also plays a key part in many royal events throughout the year. The most famous of these events are the Queen's Garden Parties, which can each welcome up to 24,000 guests into the garden's walls. The size of the garden is so vast that it could fit 29 football fields inside its walls and still have a bit of room to host afternoon tea. There's even a lake. Camels, crocodiles, elephants, and many other whimsical members of the animal kingdom have called the palace home. During the rule of King Henry VIII, deer roamed wild throughout the grounds. Then, years later, King James introduced an entire zoo, which future royals after him gladly took up as a tradition. Queen Charlotte was given a zebra and eight elephants, and Queen Victoria had great fun riding Jumbo, ringmaster P.T. Barnum's famous circus elephant. So how much would it cost to rent out Buckingham Palace for a month? Well, it comes in at a budget-friendly amount of about $17.5 million a month. That means it would fetch about $230 million a year in rent. Let's put that number in perspective. For $17.5 million, you could buy the world's most expensive watch, encrusted with 1,200 diamonds. So that's a $3.5 million clock for yourself and three of your friends. And you'd still have $3 million left over. If Buckingham Palace isn't your flavor, maybe another royal residence, Windsor Castle, might better suit your taste. The castle spans over 580,000 square feet and holds a millennium of royal history, dating all the way back to the Normans. Windsor Castle is the largest and oldest occupied castle in the entire world. First built by William the Conqueror in the 11th century, it's been the home of 39 monarchs since. Now, the queen spends most of her weekends away from her duties at the castle. Some of its highlights include a moat room, yeah, a room for your moat. In the state apartments, you can view paintings created by many famous artists hanging on the walls. And of course, there are the arms and armor in the grand vestibule. I keep my armor in the grand vestibule in my house too. So how much would this beauty cost to rent? The monthly rent would cost you as much as to buy 40 average UK homes mortgage-free, which is $13.6 million. For the same amount, you could also buy a private island 30 minutes off the coast of Manhattan. So choose wisely. If neither of those is in your budget, 
How about Kensington Palace? It's the current home of Prince William and Kate Middleton in the center of London near Hyde Park. It's filled with multiple wings and royal apartments where many past royals have called home, one of which being Princess Diana. Will and Kate's apartments is far from what you'd picture when you think of a regular one. It's more like a mansion inside a larger mansion. A portion of it even includes a clock tower. In 1689, King William and Queen Mary bought the mansion in a village called Kensington for £20,000, about $5.3 million today. At the time, it was called Kensington House. Since then, generations of royals have continued to live in the palace. Queen Anne worked on expanding its gardens and also built the Orangery, which started out as a greenhouse. Now it serves as a restaurant open to the public. With a measly 20 rooms, it makes up for it with 30 acres of grounds. Inside, there are two greeting rooms and multiple studies for the royals to work in. Plus, it has three kitchens. So, you could get three different midnight snacks and never visit the same fridge twice. In addition, the royal apartment inside has its own private gym and an elevator, which is helpful since it spans four different floors. Renting Kensington Palace would set you back about $2.1 million a month. $2.1 million could get you a top-end Lamborghini, which has 770 horsepower and can zoom up to 60 miles per hour in just 2.8 seconds. You'd have some cash left over, though, because the Lamborghini only costs $1.9 million. So you could throw a few Honda Civics in your shopping cart, too, if you wanted. Sandringham House is the beloved country home away from home of Queen Elizabeth II. Sandringham is a huge estate that the royals use for many occasions, since it has features ranging from fruit farms to a full museum. Mostly, it's where the English royals love to spend their winter holidays. It's in Norfolk, England, about 100 miles north of London, and is built on 20,000 acres of land. Put that in perspective. An acre was first measured as the size of land that could be plowed in one day with an ox in the Middle Ages. So, to plow Sandringham Estates land in one day, you would need 20,000 people and 20,000 oxen. In 1862, the British royal family bought the estate as a country retreat for the Prince of Wales, Edward VII, and his fiancée, Alexandra of Denmark. After that, the estate was passed on to Queen Elizabeth II. There are more than 200 people who work on the estate, which includes farmers, gardeners, and workers in the sawmill and fresh apple juice pressing plant. How much would monthly rent be in this sprawling abode? About the same cost as buying 53 Arabian horses, which is $8.5 million. The Palace of Versailles in France was originally a private retreat for Louis XIII and his family. Under the direction of Louis XIV, the royal residence was expanded and remodeled into immense and ornate premises surrounded by stately gardens. Every detail of it was designed to glorify Louis XIV and highlight his extravagance. A landscape artist crafted French gardens with fountains that created an illusion of magically still water, meant to express the power the king had over even nature. It was also the private residence of Marie Antoinette. Of all of them, the most decadent room is the Hall of Mirrors. It's a long gallery lined with 17 mirrors, which sit opposite 17 windows to reflect the gardens outside. Opulent chandeliers gleam on the intricately painted ceiling, and the walls are built from white marble. How much does it cost to live like Marie Antoinette for a month? Well, there actually are rooms available for the public to rent. They start at $2,600, and with 2,300 rooms in total, that brings the rental value for the whole place up to $179 million per month. That's the equivalent of buying 55 grand pianos sculpted from pure crystal, which costs $3.2 million each. Okay, but really, did you know there are castles you can actually rent? There's a castle called Pete's Castle in Ireland, which was built over 600 years ago. Even though it has retained its original structure from the 1400s, in modern years, it's been renovated to make it a dream destination. But keep in mind, it's an actual ancient castle, so it's no Four Seasons. There are narrow staircases, and none of the rooms were designed for running water. Meaning, if you need the bathroom at 3 a.m., it's a chilly walk. It costs $145 per night, 
and it's open for anyone looking for a royally extravagant holiday to rent. If that's more in your budget range, I understand. We can't all have the money to buy 53 Arabian horses every month. When Gustave Eiffel was designing his famous tower in Paris, he added a secret apartment for himself right on top of it. Visitors to the third level can now take a glimpse of the apartment through a small window. It has wax figures of Eiffel himself, his daughter Claire, and Thomas Edison, who is one of the lucky fellows who got to see it in Eiffel's time. There are also secret apartments on the other side of the Atlantic, in the New York Public Libraries. They're meant for the library superintendents and their families. They used to live, cook meals, take showers, and do other regular things in the Schwartzman Building on 5th Avenue. They also had a cool bonus of walking the library rooms at night. Daughter of the first superintendent, John Fiedler, was even born in there. A whole maze of tunnels called the Hypogeum is hidden under Rome's Colosseum. Back in the day, when it was an arena, the chambers in the tunnels were used to house gladiators, the equipment for special effects, and giant cages with animals – elephants, leopards, panthers, and bears. Oh my! Starting from 2010, tourists have been allowed to get a tour of the maze. Disney's Magic Kingdom in Florida has its own maze of color-coded tunnels for way less sinister purposes. It's a whole city used by cast members to keep the magic alive. This is where they dress up, have lunch, rehearse, and move from one land to another without kids spotting them. To make it all possible, construction workers had to dig 8 million tons of earth to put the entire park on an elevation and build the tunnels on ground level. If you're ever lucky enough to visit the basement of the White House under the North Portico, you'll find some unexpected places. The carpenter's shop is where the equipment and furniture of the White House gets renovated. The flower shop makes and takes care of flower arrangements for different rooms in the house and centerpieces for events. There is also a dental surgery and a one-lane bowling alley. Behind the mist and water of Niagara Falls, it's a limestone cave of the evil spirits. It has a sinister history involving famous French explorer La Salle. According to the legend, a voice told him to leave the area in the Iroquois language. When he didn't listen, his life turned into one huge misfortune. The cave is still producing scary groaning sounds today. Next time you're waiting for your departure at Grand Central Terminal, Remember, you can play some tennis at the Vanderbilt Luxury Tennis Club. It's in the annex on the fourth floor, which used to be an art gallery, a TV studio for CBS, and even an indoor ski slope covered with artificial grass. Now there are two tennis courts, two practice lanes, and a fitness room in there. A basketball court, nicknamed the highest court in the land, is located just above the courtroom on the fifth floor of the United States Supreme Court building in Washington, D.C. It was used as a room for journalists up until the 1940s when it was turned into a workout room. It's not open to the general public, but clerks, off-duty police officers, and other Supreme Court employees like to play here between court sessions. There is a hall of records hidden behind President Abraham Lincoln's face at Mount Rushmore. The monument sculptor, Gutzon Borglum, wanted to put it there to make it forever significant. Years after he passed away, the room got porcelain enamel panels with the words to the U.S. Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and the Declaration of Independence, and explanations why these very presidents were chosen for the monument. If you ever make it to Florence, Italy, go check out an unmarked door on the first floor of the Uvisi Gallery. It opens into the Vasari Corridor built in the 16th century and connecting the gallery to Pitti Palace. To build it, architect Vasari had to go through several medieval towers and even people's homes. One family objected, so the corridor had to go around their tower. You can now see 16th and 17th centuries art inside the corridor. New York City's iconic Waldorf Astoria Hotel stands atop the mysterious abandoned Track 61. There is a locked door on 49th Street and a private elevator leading there. 
VIPs like presidents and celebrities used it to enter the hotel unnoticed by the public. There's still a train car at the station. There are no official tours going there, but now that you know of it, you can spot the station out of the window on some Metro North trains to your right. The Sydney Opera House was opened by Queen Elizabeth II herself in 1973. It has venues for opera, ballet, classical, and modern music and dance, and an added bonus of a nightclub called The Studio, fitting 300 people. It plays underground music and hosts contemporary music festivals featuring famous rappers. The smallest police station in Great Britain used to be located in a lamppost right in Trafalgar Square. It was put there in 1926 to accommodate one police officer who'd secretly watch over strike activists. They say it even had a phone line to call Scotland Yard. The place is now used as a cleaning closet. One of the most famous sites of New York has an extra floor not so many people know about. Mostly celebrities and engineers have access to floor 103 of the Empire State Building. They get there through a hidden stairway, and the view is perfectly unobstructed as there is just a knee-high ledge with a railing. The Amazon rainforest in Brazil is a secret home to more tribes completely disconnected from the rest of the world than any other place. There are over 100 of those groups that have a dramatic history of encounters with outsiders. Whenever a stranger approaches, they use arrows, clubs, and other things to protect themselves or simply hide behind the trees. A few years ago, scientists found a mysterious void above the Grand Gallery of Egypt's Great Pyramid of Giza. They still don't know exactly how large the void is because they can't go in or use usual research methods not to destroy a tiny bit of the pyramid. Only super-sensitive detectors are used on it from the outside. The researchers are guessing it could have served as another gallery or a construction ramp. A giant statue of Leonardo da Vinci has been welcoming visitors to Rome at Fiumicino Airport since 1960. 46 years after its opening, the statue was going through renovation. One of the workers found a little hatch in the middle of it. There were two parchments inside, still perfectly preserved. Take your binoculars with you, and maybe you can spot them from the plane the next time you're there. Roxy Suite is located in one of New York's prime locations, on the fifth floor above the stage of Radio City Music Hall. It was named after a vaudeville producer who wanted to have his own apartment in the theater itself back in 1932. You can take a good look at it during the stage door tour or rent it as long as you have some good spare money. St. Mark's Basilica in Venice is so majestic on the outside, you'd hardly want to look underground. If you do, though, you'll find a well-preserved mysterious 11th century crypt. A lot's happened to it in all this time. It used to be sealed because of floods. There's still water inside it now, which looks like a mirror pool. It's pretty tricky, but not impossible to get a tour of it. Abraham Lincoln Memorial is sitting on a marble throne on top of a three-story basement. Engineers building the monument set concrete columns in there to support the construction. By the time it was discovered in 1975 during renovation, the basement had turned into a legit cave with stalactites and an ecosystem. They also found some graffiti from 1914 down there. The room will likely be turned into retail space, and visitors will be able to see all the underground findings safely. If you ask Google to give you directions to Little Compton Street, it shows just one spot that looks like a mistake. In reality, the street is completely hidden under Charing Cross Road. The street level used to be way lower where the basements are today. It was raised in the late 19th century, and an office block was set on top of Little Compton Street. You can still see two road signs showing where it was. Uh, see the barrel? About four and a half feet tall? There's nothing unusual about it, except for the fact that it's bobbing and dunking just above the churning chaos of Niagara Falls. 
another moment or two, and the barrel's hurtling over the edge and toward the bottom of the waterfall more than 170 feet down. What you can't see is that there's a fool, I mean, person inside the barrel. Annie Edson Taylor was born into a family with eight kids. Her father was a flour mill owner. He passed away when the girl was 12, but he left enough money for his family to have a comfortable living. So, when Annie decided to build a school teacher career, there was nothing to prevent her from doing it. She even earned an honors degree after finishing a four-year-long training course. While studying, she met her future husband. Unfortunately, their marriage didn't last long. Sadly, Annie became a widow. The woman spent decades of her life in all kinds of teaching jobs and moving between different places. Years later, she ended up in Bay City, Michigan. She wanted to become a dancing instructor, but there wasn't any dancing schools in the city. No problem, Taylor opened up one of her own. In 1900, she moved to the city of Sault Ste. Marie to teach music. Later, she traveled to San Antonio, Texas, and even visited Mexico City in search of work. When this attempt failed, she returned to Bay City. But all this traveling, though exciting, left her with almost no money and very few belongings. She needed to work out a way to bolster her bank account for when she wouldn't be able to work anymore. One day, she was reading a newspaper article about the daredevils who had been riding out the dangerous rapids at the bottom of Niagara Falls. An idea occurred to her. Hmm, she thought. Why don't I do better and actually plunge over the waterfall? If I survive, I'll become famous. In truth, Annie had no doubt she would get out of this adventure alive. She was an exceptionally determined and upbeat woman. That's why she immediately got down to work, putting her plan into action. Annie wasn't naive enough to believe she would manage to survive the fall without some kind of protection. That's why Annie chose to use a custom-made pickle barrel. She designed the vessel herself. First, she sketched a diagram and made a prototype out of cardboard. Then she handpicked each piece of wood that had to be used for the barrel. A local company that produced beverage kegs used this wood to construct the barrel. It was an uneven, 5-foot tall and 3-foot wide container made of white oak and weighing about 160 pounds. It was secured by 10 wide metal hoops. Inside the cask, there was a leather harness to prevent Annie from bouncing around and a mattress to cushion the fall. A massive 200-pound metal block was placed at the bottom of the barrel. It had to serve as ballast, keeping the barrel in the upright position. Soon, everything was ready for the show. Annie decided to perform it on her 63rd birthday, on October 24, 1901. Curiously, the woman told the reporter she was in her 40s. People who were supposed to help Taylor with her plunge were skeptical. Even on the day when it had to take place, the event was put off several times. The assistants were afraid that if something went wrong, they would be to blame. But finally, at about 4 p.m., the barrel was loaded onto a rowboat and Annie climbed inside. She was holding her lucky heart-shaped pillow. The assistants screwed down the lid and pumped in some fresh air. There had to be enough for her to breathe for one hour. But the entire trick was supposed to take much less time, about 20 minutes. Finally, the hole used for venting the air was corked, and the brave woman floated away on her risky business. Several thousand onlookers were eyeing the process. The container with Annie inside was towed from the Niagara River's deeper Canadian side toward the Horseshoe Falls. It's the largest of the two cascades that form Niagara Falls. Near Goat Island, the barrel was set adrift and floated toward the mighty cataract. Was Annie nervous? Yeah, that would be a great understatement. Her heart was beating wildly in her chest. Her breathing was fast, too fast. Her hands and feet were cold and her palms sweating. It felt as if there wasn't enough air inside the wooden container. But the woman was determined to be brave. Suddenly, the barrel accelerated, caught in the current, and dashed toward the edge of the waterfall. People watching from the shore couldn't see it anymore. The thing was lost in the mist surrounding the whirling water. Inside her fragile shelter, Annie was listening to the roar of the falls. It was growing louder and louder. A moment of bizarre calm at the very edge, and the barrel plunged from the height greater than the Arc de Triomphe in Paris. The fall was shorter than Annie had expected. 
Mere seconds later, her vessel hit the surface and went underwater. The barrel was spinning wildly and tossed around like a twig. A moment later, it resurfaced. The vessel was intact, but water had already started to seep in. After drifting downstream for a while, the barrel came to a stop at a rock in the river. Immediately, Annie's assistants were next to it. A bunch of anxious men tore the lid off. Annie, seasick, bruised, and clutching her soaked pillow, was looking back at them. One of the rescuers was so shocked to see her alive that he grabbed a megaphone and shouted this news to the spectators. The Maid of the Mist, a tour boat lingering nearby, blew her horn to celebrate Annie's success. Annie said later that she had lost consciousness only once, right after the fall. The rest of the time, she was alert and feeling everything that was happening to the barrel. Annie found the fame she had been seeking. She was nicknamed the Goddess of Water and got celebrity status almost instantly after her adventure. People even wrote poems about her. Sadly, she didn't manage to earn as much money as she had hoped, and her fame was fleeting. Annie wrote memoirs, and she was going to sell the book near Niagara Falls. But her manager disappeared, having stolen her barrel. Annie spent almost all her savings on private detectives trying to get the thing back. She had been planning to use it as a prop while giving public speeches. Sometime later, the barrel was spotted in Chicago. But before Annie could get her hands on it, the barrel vanished again, this time for good. The only thing Annie could do was to pose for photographs at her souvenir stand. She also tried to write a novel and reconstruct her fall on film, but no movie was ever shown. In 1906, the woman even mentioned she could take a second plunge into the waterfall, but it never happened. Several years after Annie's stunt, both the Canadian and New York authorities introduced special laws. They were supposed to prevent risk-takers from following in the school teachers' daring footsteps. It didn't stop people from trying and facing huge fines. Well, dare I say it? It was more fun than a barrel of monkeys. <laughs>
And the name says it all. It's chock full of snakes. In fact, there are so many of them, especially the venomous varieties, that Brazil has forbidden access to the island to any and all visitors. But even if it wasn't closed off, not many would be brave enough to go to a place where a single step offshore could land you a venomous bite. Now, I'll bet that fly geyser in the middle of the Nevada desert was created partly because humans became jealous of that. This place had been just another bit of desert until 1916. People came here to drill a water well. They quickly saw the error of their ways, though. The water came out boiling hot and unfit for drinking. 50 years later, there was another attempt, but the same thing happened. We don't learn, do we? Anyway, hot water never stops spewing from under the ground. And today, we have a massive geyser cluster colored in shades of red, orange, and yellow. Now, I'd say let's take a break from things that could bite, burn, or crush you and take a walk in a serene forest. We're in Japan, and it's Sagano Bamboo Forest, a marvelous natural park where you can't help but hush your voice and just look. And listen, too. Because the sound of the wind in the bamboo trees is the first ever officially recognized soundscape. All the more surprising to find such a place just half an hour's ride from Kyoto, one of the busiest cities in the country. Take a deep breath of fresh air now. You're gonna need it. We're going underwater. Behold the Great Blue Hole, apparently named by Captain Obvious. It's one of the most beautiful places on the planet. Located off the coast of Belize, this giant sinkhole is a massive tourist attraction, especially popular among divers. It's actually a whole cave system, and they say it gets weirder and more picturesque the deeper you dive. Beware, though! It's popular among sharks, too, and both bull sharks and hammerheads have been spotted here more than once. Here, have a towel and prepare for some barbecue. The Darvasa gas crater is waiting. A huge hole again, this time in the ground and burning. Over 50 years ago, geologists found this spot in Turkmenia, Central Asia, and were quite a bit alarmed. There was an enormous deposit of methane, a highly flammable gas, underground. They set it on fire to prevent the gas from spreading, and since then, the holes kept burning. It's over 200 feet across and 100 feet deep, and no one knows when it'll finally run out of fuel. Is it too hot again? Well, let's have a little swim with jellyfish then. Jellyfish Lake on one of the rock islands in Palau is perfectly described by its name. In 2005, there were about 30 million of these creatures here. Although today only 700,000 of them remain, their number is growing, and tourists can actually swim with them. Until they get stung, that is. Okay, kidding. These jellyfish don't have stingers, so it's safe. Until they decide to grow stingers, of course. From the depths, we're going even deeper. The Gomantong Caves are our next stop. The cave system on the island of Borneo could have been Batman's hideout, given how many bats live there. At night, these nocturnal animals fly out of the cave in the thousands, making you wonder why you're still there watching it. But if you're brave enough to go inside the cave, you can truly marvel at the variety given to us by nature. Because there, on the floor and walls of the cave, lie tons of bat droppings, giving food and home to millions of cockroaches, parasites, and giant centipedes. Wondrous. Okay, I'm out of here. Now, if you're as easy to get away as I am, here's a place to go – Medidi National Park in Bolivia. It's one of the largest protected areas in South America and is home to an immense variety of animals, birds, and insects. I could do without the mosquitoes, but it's still among the few places where you could see wild macaws, monkeys, capybaras, and dozens of other creatures. Still, it's better to be careful because wild animals aren't always happy to see you and there are known cases of attacks on tourists. Ever wanted to feel like Frodo Baggins in Middle Earth? Here's your chance! In Iceland, there's a slumbering volcano named Thrigúka Gegurth that welcomes guests to a tea party. Now, don't confuse this with another infamous Icelandic volcano, Eyjafjallajökull. Yeah, it's easy to mix them up, they sound so similar. Here, tourists are actually ushered down into the volcano and spend close to an hour inside, looking at the magmatic landscape. 
They say three nuka geiger can't wake up all of a sudden, but who knows? Don't forget to bring the ring of power just in case. From the lowest dungeon to the highest peak, and here we are at Mount Hua in China. It's called the most dangerous hike in the world for a reason. It's high, it's crazy scary, and it's a hike. At the height of 7,000 feet, which already makes me reconsider, there are several wooden planks nailed to the sheer wall of the mountain. When you get to the start of the hike, you put on safety gear and realize there's no turning back. You have to walk all the way. And then back! But if you're lucky, you'll see a crowd of hundreds of tourists and decide not to spend hours waiting for your turn. Finally, to really creep you out, I'm taking you to Pripyat in Ukraine. If you watch the TV show Chernobyl, you probably know what happened in this area. If you didn't see it, well, don't have a meltdown. Much of the town is still off-limits for visitors, but there are already guided tours around the place. As haunting as it is, the landscape has some magnetic force. The silence makes you keep as quiet as you can. Also, you can see with your own eyes what happens when people abandon a whole city. Nature takes back what once belonged to it. Creeping vines along the walls and lampposts, trees and bushes sprouting from under concrete. And the main attraction in this desolate place is the rusty old Ferris wheel. That sure shivers my timbers. Bright, colorful flashes of pink and green light up the sky. You're watching it from your backyard in Pennsylvania. That's not something you're used to, but it's very likely to happen more often in the near future as the northern lights are shifting south. Northern lights, or auroras, appear as a result of solar storms. The sun is a huge ball of molten gases that are constantly moving, so such storms aren't rare. Our star produces a huge amount of energy that goes our way. It travels as electrical charges at the speed of about 3 million miles per hour, no big deal. When all those tiny particles from the sun reach Earth's atmosphere, they give some of the energy to atoms and molecules in its upper layer. The atoms and molecules can't hold it and give it off as light. You can see it as spectacular auroras around the magnetic poles of the northern and southern hemispheres. If you were watching them from space, they'd look like large ovals. The brightness, colors, and shapes auroras take depend on the altitude where the lights are formed and what particles take part in the process. In the Northern Hemisphere, locations like Alaska, Canada, and much of Scandinavia normally get to see the brightest lights. The biggest solar storm ever was recorded in 1859, and it was so powerful that the Northern Lights were spotted in Cuba and Honolulu, and Southern Lights were seen as far up as Santiago, Chile. In latitudes like that of New York, people were able to read newspapers in the dark under those northern lights alone. If something similar happened today, it would have caused one to two trillion dollars in damage. With solar activity and pressure from the solar winds increasing, the Aurora Belt's borders are currently shifting south. Solar activity goes in cycles, each of them 11 years long. We're now in solar cycle 25, which started in December 2019, and will reach its maximum strength between November 2024 and March 2026. So, geomagnetic storms will become stronger and probably even reach G5 levels. Those levels are their strength ratings. For you to see the northern lights south of the Great Lakes, a storm must be rated at least G3. G5 storms will be able to produce auroras that will even reach Florida. In case you don't want to wait for the sun activity to peak in 2025, head north if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, or south if you're in the Southern Hemisphere. Auroras down there are known as the Southern Lights, or Aurora Australis. It doesn't have to be cold for you to see the Northern Lights, it just has to be dark. Auroras are active throughout the year. You can't see them from April to August in the northernmost parts of the world because it's light 24-7. It's also important that there isn't any precipitation or clouds in the sky. Those will block your view. Light pollution won't help either, so move away from any cities. Try to get to an elevation to maximize your chances of spotting the lights. They can appear in a whole variety of colors, including white-gray. The green-yellow part you're most likely to imagine while thinking of the lights is just the easiest to spot with an unaided human eye. Sometimes you might not see the lights at all, but your camera will still catch them. 
They might seem dangerously close to Earth, but the closest the Northern Lights ever get to us is 50 miles. For comparison, planes normally fly at around 6 miles above the surface, and that already seems like a lot. The distance from Earth defines the color of the auroras. When atoms giving us this spectacular show collide closer to Earth, you can see blues and violets in the sky. Green and red auroras are born further away from our planet. Earth isn't the only planet to have northern lights. Jupiter and Saturn both have strong magnetic fields, and scientists spotted auroras up there using the Hubble Space Telescope and the Cassini and Galileo spacecraft. It looks like Saturn's auroras are also caused by solar winds, but it's not so clear about Jupiter. Despite what you can often see online, the northern lights aren't going to disappear altogether. Once the sun passes its activity peak and becomes less active, both the northern and the southern lights will happen less frequently, but will still be gorgeous. Another beautiful rare phenomenon is called the green flash. It happens shortly after sunset or before sunrise when the sun is almost entirely below the horizon, and the Earth's atmosphere bends and scatters light from it. People mostly spot it over the ocean. It can also be yellow, blue, or purple. About once a year, you can spot a rare fire nado in the U.S. Fire tornadoes start when a strong wind picks up heat from a fire. They are made of a flame or ash. They're different from regular tornadoes because they don't start from cyclones. Fire nados are about as tall as the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Unlike fire nados, fire rainbows or rainbow clouds don't cause any damage at all as they don't have anything to do with fire. You can only see them when the sun is very high in the sky and its light is passing through ice clouds, so they're pretty rare. The rainbow halos are just as unique. Again, it takes a specific type of ice crystals in the clouds of the surface of the Earth to bend light from the sun into a perfect ring. The same thing can happen with moonlight. The only difference will be that the moon halos are usually white and sun halos can be rainbow colored. A white rainbow is another rare illusion, this time created by fog and water. Like a usual rainbow, it's formed when light is shining through droplets of water. It loses color because fog droplets are hundreds of times smaller than those of rain. A white rainbow is sometimes mistaken for a moon bow. You can spot this one at nighttime as the moon illuminates it. That's why it's not so bright. If you ever see an upside down rainbow in the sky, that's a circumzenithal arc. It's not really a rainbow, but a kind of halo like those around the sun or the moon. This optical phenomenon is caused by ice crystals in the upper atmosphere. You have the best chance to see a circumzenithal arc when the sun is rather low in the sky. It happens super rarely, but it can rain without a single cloud in the sky. It's sometimes called a sun shower because it looks like the rain is falling straight from the sun. In reality, rain clouds are at a distance from that specific location. With sun rays being angled, the clouds become out of sight. Then, it takes just a little wind to blow the rain in your direction. If you ever travel to regions with high altitudes, you might see something called penitentes. Those ice spikes form only in a really cold and elevated environment where the air is dry. The sunlight turns ice directly into vapor instead of melting it into water. That's why these blades of snow and ice up to 15 feet tall start to pop up on the surface of the Earth. One of the rarest types of clouds is lenticular clouds that look like giant mountain hats. They're formed when moist air travels over a mountain or a mountain range and gets into an area of turbulence. Volcanoes can produce bolts of lightning. They're formed in columns of volcanic ash through friction and static electricity to connect the positively and negatively charged particles. To understand how it works, you can rub a balloon across your hair or your feet across a carpet and then touch a metal doorknob. Once a year, just for a few moments, a waterfall in Yosemite turns into a fireball. In winter and early spring, two streams flow down El Capitan Mountain in perfect conditions in February when the sun is hiding behind the horizon, it gets into the right position to reflect off the wall and color the water into fiery orange. The coldest part of our planet, Antarctica, keeps surprising us. 
Take a look at this waterfall named Blood Falls. Reddish water falls from the white ice. Scientists concluded that the color is related to iron. The water coming from the glacier oxidizes and rusts when it's exposed to oxygen, and the red color occurs. Step on Mount Gandic. It lays eggs. Well, maybe not real eggs, but the stones certainly look like dinosaur eggs. That's why the mountain got its fame. The, let's call them stone eggs, formed in one part of the mountain over 500 million years ago. Interestingly, this phenomenon repeats once every 30 years. Eggs come out in various sizes and shades. The stones appear on the surface of the cliff. A study made in the area has revealed that the composition of the stones of the cliff isn't similar to other parts of the mountain. Here, calcareous rocks rule. They're more prone to erosion. They ripen off day by day. It took three decades for the stones to get to the egg shape. Yet, it's still a mystery how these rock formations can be so perfectly spherical and smooth. According to scientists, every stone egg has an organic core. They're made of shells, plant remains, fish teeth, and skeletons. Maybe this has something to do with it. Gulu Village is close to the stone eggs. Locals believe that these eggs are sacred. Villagers associate it with good fortune. In fact, nearly every family has one of these eggs in their house. Unfortunately, there are only about 70 eggs left, so if you want to see them, you gotta hurry up! The Rich Hat structure is a circular geological phenomenon in the Sahara Desert near Mauritania. It's made out of rocks in layers, and these layers look very much like rings. No wonder the unique structure even got NASA's attention. Up from the sky, the geological feature seems to be swirling and spinning. Scientists are still not sure how these rings got there. Some say it was an asteroid impact. Many others believe that it was a natural geological process. To them, the Rich Hat structure is an uplifted and eroded dome. Geologists often classify it as a domed anticline. The scientists discovered that the rocks at the center are older than the ring-shaped outer rocks. So it seems like the stones have been eroded to flat rock layers. Anyway, there's no valid explanation for this phenomenon, and the 28-mile-long mystery of the Sahara is still to be solved. Number 4 is Rapa Nui, or Isla de Pasqua, but I bet you know it as Easter Island. Yeah, it's got three names. It was discovered by Jacob Rogovine, who actually never intended to look for that island. He just casually landed there one Sunday. That's where the name comes from. Jacob was supposed to find Terra Australis. Disclaimer, it's not Australia. This one never existed and was nothing but a hypothetical continent. Plus, he wanted to peek at Davis Land, which was believed to have once been seen by Edward Davis, the pirate, not Edward Davis the saxophone player. Jacob failed at that too, though nobody ever saw that island except for the pirate Davis. Jacob may have failed to discover some lands he wanted to, but he discovered Easter Island instead. This is an island and special territory of Chile, located in the southeastern Pacific Ocean. It's on my list because nearly 1,000 stone statues called Moai were found there. They were created by the Rapa Nui people. Nearly all statues represent gigantic heads, but there are also a small number of figures kneeling with their hands over their stomachs. Each statue represented chiefs or other important members of Easter Island society. To curve those statues, the locals used volcanic stones that were softened. Our next stop is the gateway to the underworld. Nah, don't worry. This is just how people labeled Darvaza gas crater in Turkmenistan. This giant natural gas crater has been there for five decades. This crater is continuously burning gases. The president of the country wants experts to find a way to extinguish this continuous firing pit. This site was created by people accidentally in 1971 while working on a natural gas project. Ever since then, the flames have been on, and it's become a tourist attraction. Mysterious constructions are sometimes built in our era, too. We don't have to go millions of years ago to long-gone civilizations. Edward Leach Scollin single-handedly built a structure called Coral Castle in Homestead, Florida. He didn't use any large machinery. He carved and sculpted more than 1,100 tons of coral rock in 28 years until 1951. It's a mystery how he managed to do it all by himself. 
Leedscallen sculpted the sedimentary rock into different objects, such as walls, tables, chairs, a fountain, and a sundial. There's of course a legend behind this mystery too. He was inspired to build the structure after being abandoned by his fiancée on their wedding day. Uh-oh, runaway bride! Well, he wanted to prove his love to her and the world, so he wanted to do something extraordinary. Well, he definitely nailed it! Now, let's talk a little bit about the mystery of the Namibian fairy circles. There are millions of circular patches in hundreds of miles ranging from 10 to 65 feet in diameter. They're called fairy circles because they look like a fairy or an otherworldly creature made them. These are essentially oval-shaped soil surrounded by grass. There are a lot of local beliefs surrounding the creator of these marks, yet science says something else. Biologists and mathematicians have been puzzled by the mystery of the Namibian fairy circles for decades. There is more than one theory to explain this phenomenon. Here's one popular theory. The water is limited in the desert, so plants compete to reach the water. Some plants expand and thrive into a patch, but smaller plants nearby cannot get the necessary water to live. In the end, some vegetation disappears, and the remaining ones stay at the patch's edges. That's why they form such regular distant gaps. What if I tell you that there is a hill in Leh City, India, where, instead of rolling downwards, things roll uphill? It's an optical illusion. The road looks like it's a sloping hill because of its surrounding landscapes, yet the road actually goes down. These kinds of hills are called magnetic hills or gravity hills. Scientific explanations vary. The most common theory says that the hill has such a strong magnetic force that it can pull cars in the vicinity. Now, how about seeing some flaming rocks? Yanartash spread over an area of over 3 square miles. The place is located on a rocky mountain in southwest Turkey near the town of Chiaralea. Yanartash got its name from its appearance. It literally means flaming stone. The rocks have been flaming for at least 2,500 years, and they'll probably keep burning for the coming decades. The mountain where the rocks are is an inactive volcano, so it's full of tiny fumaroles that release gases such as methane. The gas ignites when it comes into contact with oxygen and creates the flaming effect. Uh, And by the way, back in the day, sailors used the flames as a natural lighthouse, as it's really close to the sea. Today, it's more of a tourist attraction, though. Hikers love it, too. Now, walk on this frozen Lake Abraham in Canada. In winter, the frozen water gets filled with ice bubbles. It looks magical, but these white orbs aren't that safe. They consist of flammable methane gas. Ew. Beauty can be misleading. The next one is from Racetrack Death Valley, USA. There is a dry lake bed with moving rocks. Now these odd rocks look as if they've been pushed or dragged by someone or something. They leave both a trail and a mystery behind. The force behind all this is now understood. Surprise! It's the wind and some ice. Scientists say the wind pushes the rocks during brief windows when the soil is covered with ice. Now, I can't help but notice that many mysterious things on Earth involve stones or rocks or methane. Which one of these phenomena is your favorite? Better buckle up, because you're about to explore some of the world's riskiest and nerve-wracking roads. You better pack some water and snacks, and prepare for exquisite views and extreme weather. And most importantly, no matter what you do, don't look down. Let's start with the Asian Karakoram Highway, the highest paved road in the world. It's located at 16,000 feet above sea level. It also stretches for more than 800 miles. If you're a history fan, you'll be pleased to know it follows part of the old Silk Road, an ancient trade route that connected Asia with the West. People used the road to carry goods and ideas between two great civilizations. As it splits the most mountainous region in the world, the Karakoram Highway is quite unpredictable. Rocks can often fall here, and there are also a lot of landslides, avalanches, and floods. When you take into consideration heavy snowfalls and herds of wild animals, you might decide to avoid the road altogether if you're not the most skilled driver. 
Not a fan of storms either? Well, you really shouldn't be here, trust me. The construction of this road began in the 1960s, and it's a popular tourist attraction these days. Given the altitude and lack of road barriers, many visitors also experience altitude sickness here, which can make driving even riskier. Meanwhile, the Dalton Highway in Alaska isn't a walk in the park either. For starters, at times, it gets slippery, which can give a headache to even the most experienced of drivers. This 400-mile-long road stretches through remote forests and over the Yukon River. Since there are only three towns along the road, people who need to drive on the Dalton Highway are strongly encouraged to bring their own gear and lots of supplies. The road has a 240-mile stretch with no gas stations, restaurants, hotels, and whatnot. It's the longest stretch of road with no services in North America. What makes the highway even more difficult to travel on is that most of the road is made from gravel. In the winter, it gets even more complicated since the road becomes a lot more slippery. The North Yungus Road is thought to be the world's most dangerous. Why? Well, maybe because it's a single-lane dirt road? Hmm, most probably. It connects the cities of La Paz and Coroico, stretching along the side of the Cordillera Oriental Mountains. Should you ever feel the need to look over the edge here, you'd be astonished to see that the ground really is far away, 4,000 to 15,000 feet down. The road was built in the 1930s. Its widest part is 12 feet. With the side, people driving here often have to deal with thick fog, heavy rain, and even some loose rocks every now and then. Add limited visibility and more than 200 hairpin turns to the mix. As scary as it sounds, this famous route is still one of the most popular tourist attractions in Bolivia. Heading over to New Zealand, you're about to visit a 140-year-old unpaved road carved into the side of a mountain. It's so dangerous that you have to get a special permit to drive on it. And don't even think about renting a car, as most rental companies won't allow their vehicles to go to that area. And the standard insurance won't cover any issues you might face there. Bummer. This narrow road goes almost vertically to the Shotover River. So if you come across another vehicle on the way, you certainly won't be able to pass each other. You'll most likely need to reverse for up to 2 miles to reach a wider part of the road. Local tour operators can take visitors up the canyon if you're really eager to visit the area, and most people are. Why? Well, because this road was a popular backdrop for a lot of movies. Looking for some peace and quiet? The Canning Stock Route might just be the place for you. You won't get any views here, just a lot of dust and barely anyone around. Not to mention, there aren't many road signs, and it's really easy to get lost here. This completely secluded road stretches for 1,150 miles. You can find it in Western Australia. You'll need three weeks to drive it from start to finish, so it's best if you book yourself some time off work if you really plan on visiting. Just don't start your journey in the summer months, as the temperatures there can be almost unbearable. Don't forget to pack plenty of food, water, and spare parts. And most importantly, don't drive alone. You'd better follow a convoy of experienced drivers. Not all of the dangerous roads in the world are located on the edges of mountains or in a desert. Some seem quite unremarkable at first glance, like Commonwealth Avenue in the Philippines. At first glance, it's a regular highway that is a mere 7.5 miles long. But it has 18 lanes and a lot of heavy traffic. It also gets flooded pretty often because of the poor drainage system. And since motorbikes and pedestrians often cross the road in the most unexpected places, whoa! A lot of accidents happen here, sometimes also because of poor visibility and excessive speed. Now, let's head to the Bay Bird of Road in Turkey. But you really should skip this one if you're scared of landslides or have ever experienced vertigo. This dangerous road is located on the shore of the Black Sea in the northeastern part of the country. Why is it so perilous, you might ask? Well, for starters, you won't find any protective guardrails separating the road from the abyss. Apart from the spectacular view, there's really no point in challenging yourself to go here if you're not a professional driver. 
The road has a total of 13 hairpin turns at a height of 5,600 to 6,700 feet above sea level. And all that on a stretch of a mere 3 miles. And the incline is also steep, up to 10%. Morocco has a scary road of its own. It's called the Tizi and Tess Pass. It's a tight, winding road that goes through the Atlas Mountains. It was constructed by blasting out mountain rocks back in the 1920s. Again, it's one of those places you should avoid if you're afraid of heights and steep roads. But if you can deal with these tough conditions, you'll be rewarded with amazing views. There are no safety barriers along the road either, so it's best to travel on it only during the day when it's light. In the winter, landslides and avalanches are a daily occurrence here. Keep that in mind if your car is not prepared for this kind of weather. The Atlantic Road in Avare, Norway, can offer you a real 3D experience. It winds through a small group of scenic islands in this northern European country. But as beautiful as it might look, it's one of Norway's most dangerous roads. Why? Well, because, at times, it makes you feel like you're on a real-life roller coaster. The road has a lot of twists and turns. You'll also need to be ready for some serious bouts of bad weather. That's probably the reason why visibility is often reduced here. More so, if you have to drive on this road on a stormy day, you'll have to deal with strong winds and huge waves. Moving on, it's often called the best road in the world by fans of driving. But in reality, it isn't for the faint-hearted either. Transfigurison is a road in Romania and is probably the most famous one in this country. It winds through some of the highest mountains in this Eastern European country, the Fagaris Mountains. You won't be able to drive on this road from late autumn to late spring, as it's closed to the public because of frequent heavy snowfalls. Even during the summer, this road is closed from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. for additional safety. Not a fan of bears? Then you probably ought to skip this road, as bears often pop up in this location. These animals aren't dangerous if you don't interact with them, reach out, or offer them any food. Just the bare necessities. This summer, you finally decide to go on that once-in-a-lifetime round-the-world trip. The first stop of this exciting adventure is in Europe. You start your journey in Italy, the country of pasta and pizza and delicious gelato. Ah, there it is, the world-renowned Leaning Tower of Pisa. You buy your ticket and get inside the crooked monument. You're about to climb 251 slippery stairs, so watch your step and don't forget to breathe. The white marble stones are astounding, and from time to time, you peep outside to enjoy the view of the city. Congratulations, you've made it! You've reached the top of the bell tower and can take all the selfies you want. The Leaning Tower of Pisa is one of Italy's most iconic landmarks. During your hike up the stairs, a guide tells you it's actually a medieval monument. It was built between the 12th and 14th centuries, taking over 200 years to finish. And in case you're wondering if it's always been tilted, I can say without a doubt, yes it has. Once they finished the third floor, the bell tower started sinking. The thing is, the very name Pisa comes from the Greek word that means marshy land. The ground there is extremely soft, made of clay, mud, and sand. And architects have been trying to save the day ever since they built the tower. At the top of the 185-foot-tall monument, you take your time admiring the city. How many terracotta rooftops can you count? If you walk toward the south side of the monument, you may feel closer to the ground. This is because the Leaning Tower of Pisa tilts toward the south. At one point, it leaned almost 5.5 degrees and still didn't fall. Today, when you visit the monument, the guide might tell you the tower is leaning less. A few years ago, the world's best architects and engineers did some construction works next to the monument to keep it from falling over. They dug several tunnels and took out over 38 cubic meters of soil from under the north side of the tower. So now the tower is tilting at an angle of only 4 degrees. So, if you want to take one of those classic photos where you're holding up the tower, you better hurry. Who knows how long the tower will still be leaning. Now it's time for you to make your way to Rome. This city is basically an open-air museum, and you have to check it out for yourself. It's scalding hot, but you're lucky. 
Today, you're visiting the Baths of Caracalla. Are you ready for an authentic ancient Roman experience? You enter through what once was a locker room. You'll have to use your imagination. Today, you'll only see 130-foot-tall brick walls here. Romans of every class would spend an hour or two in the baths every day. They would come after a long day at work or before dinner. Imperial bath complexes, such as this one, were usually free, but you had to pay an admission fee. Leaving the locker room, visitors would stop in a heated room where they would receive oil and scrub massage. Then, some people would move on to one of two exercise yards. Can you see how ample they were? Here, there were elaborate marble porticos, and you can still see a few fragments of the mosaic-colored floor. If you were in the mood for something more intellectual, you could stop to listen to a philosopher or visit one of the libraries. Now we've arrived at the most impressive room, a caldarium. It was a circular hot steamed room measuring 115 feet in diameter. It had not one or two, but seven heated pools inside. Above your head, you'd have seen a magnificent dome supported by large granite columns. The entire structure was richly decorated with multicolored glass mosaics and the finest white marble. The complex also housed an indoor Olympic-sized pool with waist-deep water. Today, you can only admire a few reddish walls made of brick and concrete. Emperor Caracalla, like many other Roman emperors, built a mega-complex, and it sure made people happy. After a long international flight, you arrive in Egypt. Get ready for some camel rides and juicy dried fruits. Does anyone here love dates? You leave your hotel at dawn and make your way to the outskirts of Cairo. You drive past the Nile River toward the West Bank. Don't forget to take some pictures. In the distance, you spot a large monument. It's the Great Sphinx of Giza. Can you believe people created this monument over 4,500 years ago? Once you get closer, you see the Great Pyramids just north of the Sphinx. You learn that, unlike the pyramids, the Sphinx was carved directly from the bedrock of the Giza Plateau. Until today, it's one of the largest statues in the world, measuring 66 feet in height and 240 feet in length from paws to tail. The face of the Sphinx looks a tad beaten today. But according to archaeologists, it wasn't always like that. A Photoshop reconstruction of the Sphinx gives it a very different look. As you can see, at one point, the Sphinx's nose was chopped off together with parts of the chin. Scientists believe that the statue is a representation of the great pharaoh Khafre. This is why its face resembles a human so much. Just below the eyes, a dark carved line was added to represent the charcoal eyeliner ancient Egyptians used to wear. Fun fact, this wasn't only a beauty habit. It protected their eyes from ultraviolet rays. In a desert region that gets so much sunlight, this might come in handy. Until today, researchers debate whether or not the Sphinx had a beard. Many believe that if it was meant to depict a pharaoh, it most likely had a braided beard that got destroyed by erosion or humans. Even today, you can still see the remains of a regal headdress on the head of the Sphinx. These head ornaments were associated with power and royalty. Now imagine that the stripes are blue and gold. This is probably what it looked like when the monument was first constructed. There's no evidence of how long it took to build the Sphinx, but it was likely very long, as the carved details are pretty impressive. If you're lucky, your guide might take you to one of the secret chambers inside the statue. If they're real and not just a myth, I mean. Ah, the crystalline waters of Greece. Whether you arrive by boat or plane, you're in for a real treat. This is the focal point of archaeological sites. You arrive at Mandraki Marina in port, but wait a minute, you don't see any monuments around. The Colossus of Rhodes is nowhere to be found at first glance. That's because it was destroyed long, long ago. Before tumbling down during a mighty earthquake, the great statue was considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. If you saw the Colossus in a picture, you would probably mistake it for Lady Liberty. Well, that's actually not a coincidence. Apparently, there's a connection between the Statue of Rhodes and the Statue of Liberty. They were both built as symbols of freedom, and Lady Liberty is often referred to as the modern Colossus. 
the Colossus stood at 100 feet tall. But today, all you see is a concrete jetty with a huge gap in the middle. Now, imagine a bronze statue straddling both ends of the bridge. The Colossus was built back in the 3rd century BCE, and 900 camels took part in the construction. The statue existed for approximately 54 years before it was ruined by a powerful earthquake. It hit the city so hard that all that was left of the statue was one very large foot. Even so, people kept visiting the monument. Are you ready to head home? Thanks for joining me on this journey, and don't forget to tell me what your favorite site was. See you next time! Welcome to Starbuck Island in the middle of the Pacific near French Polynesia. Even if the name brings to mind a strong coffee smell, you will find no frappuccino there. The island is uninhabited. It's also pretty tiny, just 5.5 miles east to west and about 2 miles north to south. The island is so small, New York City could fit in 18 such islands. Seems like there can be zero interesting things, but… Google Maps have something to surprise you. A couple of months ago, there was a viral TikTok video about a weird saucer-shaped object found on Google Maps on Starbuck Island. The video racked up over 5 million views in two days. The creepiest part is that there's a long streak traversing almost the whole island. It looks as if someone had to break with all their might but failed, and it resulted in a crash of that saucer-looking vehicle. Could that be another possible proof that we aren't alone in the universe and someone tried to visit us and couldn't drive very well? All these speculations are blood-chilling, and the users believe no one knew the true story behind those traces and the saucer. Little did they know that back in 2009, a group of explorers visited the deserted island. They made a couple of videos that were uploaded to the net. Thing is, the island didn't used to be that deserted. In the 19th century, Starbuck Island was used for guano mining. A tiny clarification here, guano is bird and bat droppings. Yeah, droppings mining doesn't sound quite convincing. But guano is rich in phosphates, and phosphates have a lot of uses and can be used as fertilizers. So, since there were some people on that island, they had to construct a sort of temporary settlement, which they did. Now, back to Google Maps. Do you see that angle? Right. The satellite picture can be compared to the pictures and videos made in 2009 by the explorers. Another point proving that this weird object has a terrestrial origin is that there are some trees on the island, which is bizarre. These trees aren't native to coral limestone terrain, and they were definitely planted by people. Mystery solved! The saucer-shaped object is not an extraterrestrial vehicle, but what remains from a settlement. And the traces stretched out across the island? Eh, who knows? But it's definitely nothing out of this world. Another TikTok user claimed they saw zombies on Google Maps. Let's see if this one is true. First off, the video scared over a million people who watched it. This TikTok starts with a view from afar, and as the user zooms in, we understand we're in Finland. Then we see an inscription. Uh, Alright, I surrender. Finnish viewers, help me out here. The next thing we see is a low-quality Google Street View image, and that shot sends shivers down my spine. It looks like a mass gathering of people, but they don't look quite alive. The image looks foggy and bewildering. Are these real zombies? Sure thing they're not. First off, let's deal with the inscription. It translates to English as a quiet people's facial artwork by this person. So, he is a Finnish dancer and choreographer and intended the silent people artwork to be part of his performance. But now it's an independent art piece. Fun fact, the silent people figures get changed twice a year, in the fall and at the beginning of the summer. They get all the clothes from donations. Bang! Another myth debunked. Right side 2, TikTok Myths Zero. Right, now take a look at that pic. Anything weird you've noticed? Right, it's a three-legged girl. The satellite picture was taken in Croatia. But there's nothing to worry about. These are nothing but Google Maps issues. Thing is, the technology used for Google Maps purposes has a curious algorithm. Each object gets photographed several times, and then the resulting photos are stitched together to achieve the most accurate image. 
In most cases, it works, but sometimes it seems like the technology tries too hard, and it results in extra details and sometimes extra limbs people have in the photo. And if we're going to have a three-legged race, then I'd bet on her. There's nothing that can escape the all-seeing satellite eye, right? On September 20th, 2022, a TikTok user posted a video about a plane found underwater on Google Earth app. The plane was found off the coast of Crooked Island in the Bahamas, not far away from Colonel Hill Airport. Now, let's see if that's true. The first thing we should keep in mind is that even Google Earth help themselves admit the fact that the pic found in the app may be the result of several photos, either satellite or aerial, taken on different days and even in different months. The result of stitching might sometimes be a bit unpredictable. Remember the three-legged girl? How could we forget? So, as you may have already guessed, this photo is nothing but stitching. The area with that plane was photographed multiple times in 2004 and 2005, then it was photographed 8 times in 2015 and a couple of times later. The most probable reason for this photo being on Google Earth is that these are the 2015 shots combined together. They say the reticulated python is the largest snake in the world and can reach a whopping 20 feet in length. There's a record of one such python found in 1912 that reached 32 feet in length. However, users found an even more staggering snake on Google Earth. On March 24, 2022, another mind-blowing video was posted on TikTok. The video got over 200,000 likes. Imagine the views! This time, the user claimed that a mega-skeleton of the extinct Titanoboa was found on Google Maps somewhere in France. It was hard to judge from the image, but the skeleton was estimated to be about 100 feet long and could have certainly been the longest snake that ever existed, if the snakes had had such a skeleton in reality. So it's the number one reason why this one is not a snake. You see, snakes have somewhat thinner ribs, and the skeleton in the picture looks way more massive. Another curious thing about this skeleton is that it turned out to be made of steel. See what I'm driving at? It's not a real skeleton, but a stunning 425-foot-long art installation. It's called this French name, which means ocean snake in French. The installation was created by a Chinese artist, Huang Yongping, and it's free to visit. The cool thing about this installation is that it only appears with tides, so it looks like a real archaeological excavation. Well, the artist made a monkey out of millions of users. If you ever travel to France, you can go check this extraordinary piece of art. It's located in this place, not far away from that place. Sometimes, Google Maps shows something that never existed. Meet Sandy Island. For a long time, it was believed to be located near New Caledonia in the Eastern Coral Sea. It all started when Captain James Cook included it in the charts back in 1774. He never visited it, but it was later included in several more charts as a precaution against reefs. At the time, it was standard practice. Plus, the area was, and is still, swarming with pumice sea rats. These are the masses left after an underwater volcanic eruption, so such a precaution was a necessity. This way, the island stayed in the charts until 1974. A flying recognition campaign claimed there was a lack of appearance of that island and Sandy Island was deleted from the charts. Google Maps appeared back in 2005, and the island, surprisingly, was there, even though it had been previously undiscovered. It got removed from Google Maps only in November of 2012. Now, there is nothing but black pixels, but there used to be a darkened sea area. Today, some specialists believe the whole situation with the island was just a copyright trap which was a popular practice among cartographers back in the day. Those traps help cartographers protect their intellectual property. So, have you ever seen anything weird on Google Maps?